It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Robert Geislinger. I have a lot of fond memories playing Centipede in the arcade when I was younger. Now, I was never any good at it, but I really enjoyed plunking the quarter down, rolling the ball around, and shooting at this pixelated worm to my heart's content. Today, I'm going to take a look at a board game that's hopefully going to recreate that feeling for me. Today, I'm taking a look at Centipede. So here we're taking a look at Centipede. Now this is a two or four player game, and I'll explain in a little bit what I mean by four player. Predominantly, you're probably going to be playing this game two players. One player is going to take the role of the gnome, and one player is going to take the role of the centipede. The centipede player will win by either getting the head of their centipede into the gnome's area, or if on their turn they manage to get one of these bugs directly above the gnome player. The gnome player will win if at any point they have removed all parts of the centipede from the board. Now, as I said, this is an asymmetric game with the gnome player using these parts here and the centipede player using these. First, we're gonna go over what the gnome player can do on their game. Now, one other thing I'm gonna note before is you see all these mushrooms here. These are randomly set up before or players even know which side they're going to be so as not to be any bias. But this is a random, so this is kind of how the game will look at setup, but it depends on the players. The centipede also starts by moving forward out six spaces, so this is how we just happen to end up. The known player's turn is going to be divided into two steps. First, there's going to be possibly a refreshed dice pool. The gnome has these six dice. If at any point there's only one die left at the start of their turn, they will take all of the die, re-roll them, and place them back into the pool. Then they will activate one of these dice. Now these dice will have actions on them that they will take from left to right. So if I were to take this die here, it has a little shoot symbol, a number, and a shoot symbol. So that means that I first get to shoot straight forward for one time. In this case, it hits a mushroom, so the mushroom comes off the board. Then I get to move four spaces, and I can go in either direction. So I could go one, two, uh, let's go one, two, three, and four. Four. And then I'm going to have to shoot again, so I remove another mushroom. Now there is one other thing on the dice that is a refresh a card. But first, let's explain what the cards are. These are additional things the gnome can use, and they can use one or none of them on their turn. The first gnome control card is here, and this allows them to refresh their dice pool. If they flip this card over, they can then refresh all of the dice on their turn. Board. This one allows them to take a free shoot action. This one allows them to move once. And this one is a glitch, which allows them to remove one mushroom from anywhere on the board. At the end of their turn, if they don't have if they didn't use any of these, they can choose to refresh one that's been used previously. Or if they have this symbol on a die that looks like a card, they'll also be able to refresh one. The gnome must always go left or right and must go the full distance unless he hits a wall, at which point he stops. If the gnome hits a mushroom, as we showed before, it is removed from the board. If it hits a flea or a spider on the board, it is removed but replaced with a mushroom. If it hits a centipede segment, we also remove that centipede segment and replace it with a mushroom. Now, the thing about hitting the centipede is let's just say for the sake of argument, these mushrooms weren't here and that the gnome was here. He would shoot in a straight line, removing this piece and replacing it with a mushroom. Well, now the centipede is in two parts. So that means that the centipede is going to have now two centipedes on the board because this new piece will become a new head. And that's gonna be it for the gnome's turn. The centipede is going to be divided into three steps on their turn. The first one is they are going to play a card from their hand. Now these cards are going to do various things such as allowing them to place a mushroom in any empty space or remove a mushroom or possibly 
spawn a new baby centipede if they had pieces that had been removed from the board. So if we played baby centipede, we could bring in this one centipede possibly here. We also have berserk where after moving our centipede, we can go down two spaces. And I'll explain how movement works here in a few minutes. We have a flea that allows us to spawn a flea anywhere on an empty space in our board. And I'll explain how those move in a minute. We have spiders as well. So we're going to play one of these cards and take the action. Then we're going to need to move our bugs. Now the centipede, the spider, and the flea all moves a little bit, well, move completely differently. The centipede is going to move a speed based on the length of it. So looking out here, we have a centipede of one, a centipede of two, and a centipede of three. Let's go with the centipede of three first. That means that it has a speed of three. Now a centipede is always going left and then back right unless it hits something. So in this case, we're gonna go three, but because there's a mushroom here, we actually move down a space and turn around, moving all of the tail with it. Now that's one, he's gonna to have to do again because he's gonna bump. So he's gonna hit this mushroom going down, which will be removed from the board. That's two, he will turn around and then he will go three that direction, moving like this. So again, he's always gonna be going for backwards and forwards, but moving down whenever he hits an obstacle or side. A centipede with a speed of length of one is also gonna get a speed four. And there are also some cards in here that can add speed bonuses, such as this centipede here, where you can spawn a centipede and then get a plus one to all of your creatures. One thing to note about spiders is they are spawned last in a turn so they don't move but fleas and newly spawned centipedes will still move that turn. Spiders can move up to nine squares per turn but they can only move vertically or diagonally. They can never move horizontally. So if we had a spider here the spider could move one and then two, three, four, five, five, six, can move there nine spaces, and maybe we want to end up there. A spider also removes a mushroom from any square it moves into. Again, as I said, it never moves the same turn it spawns. A flea, on the other hand, always moves two squares and must always go in a straight line towards the gnome. Now, it will remove a mushroom bug or centipede that it moves into, but it will jump over anything, so it's where it lands. So let's say, for instance, that our flea was here. He will move two spaces. He would land here, thus removing this portion of the centipede. You may also, if you wish, place a mushroom in any space that a flea leaves. Once the centipede has completed all of their moves, then they will draw a new card into their hand and play will pass to the gnome player. Now, as I said, the game can also be played for players. In doing so, each team will have two gnomes and two centipedes. And the game does come with an extra set of cards and gnomes and centipedes in the opposing colors in order to accommodate that. However, in the two, a four player version, the glitch card is not part of the game. In addition, the two gnome players will share in the same dice pool. Again, the game will continue on until either the centipede gets a bug in front of the gnome on their turn or gets a centipede head into the gnome's area, which case the centipede is one, or until the gnome has removed all centipede spot uh, pieces from the board, at which point the gnome has won. So let's look at Atari Centipede. Now at the beginning of this video, I stated I was a huge fan of the original Atari arcade game Centipede. And the question was, would this game relive to my memories of it? Well, yes and no. Yes, in the fact that I found it just as frustrating to me to play as I did when I played Atari back then when I was a kid. But I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing in that respect. Honestly, the game has a few good things and a few bad things. The good things in the game are the components. The game, despite its 8-bit artwork or 4-bit artwork, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure what Atari was. But despite that, the game has really nice bits that feel a little premium-ish. And there's a lot of them in here, especially since they included the 4-player version. But I'll get back to that in a minute. So the artwork and the components I really enjoy. The idea of the game I really enjoy as well. 
However, I found the game in practice to be a little fiddly. In fact, the first time I played it, I didn't like this game at all, but I decided to give it another chance, another chance, and each time I played it, I liked it a little more, but I'm not sure if that was just due to repetition of playing it or just so because I started seeing more in the game itself. Playing as the gnome player is the closest to the feeling I had in the arcade because that's what I played when I was in the arcade. You were the gnome killing the centipede. Playing as the centipede player seemed to be very confusing and almost annoying in terms of every turn I had to move all these bugs and especially the centipede, the way it moves and having to move all of the tail pieces. At first it seems kind of cool, but after a while it gets a little annoying to me. As the gnome player, I did enjoy the dice and I enjoyed the choices that I made, but one person that played this game with me made the note that to them they almost felt the game was playing itself. Now I personally didn't experience that. I did feel like there was some choices to be made, but overall, just in the world of all of the other games out there, this game just didn't hold up for my expectations. I'm not saying it's a bad game. I'm just saying it's not a great game or even a really good game either. It just is what it is sort of thing. I think if you're a fan of abstract games and you like Centipede, this might be a game you might want to pick up. It also might be a good game to gift to somebody who is a huge fan of the old Atari classics, but maybe isn't so much into modern board gaming. I did say that earlier I would get back to the four player thing and that's what I'm going to address now. I did not like this game at four players at all. At four players, the game feels completely chaotic. I can see how some people might enjoy it at four players and it's nice that they included it, but for me it just didn't work. I felt like my partner was doing more harm to me than good each time I played it. So by and far, I would never recommend this game to anyone for players. Would I recommend the game to players? Yes, as a play game. I'm, again, I'm not sure that this is a game that's gonna stay in my collection. Overall, if you're looking for a game that is an based on the Atari license, this might be a game worth looking at. If you like abstract games, this might be a game worth looking at. There are some unique mechanisms, but by and far, over time, I just found the game to be more annoying than it was enjoyable. I hope you've enjoyed this look, however, at Centipede, and it's helped you decide whether or not the game might or might not be right for your collection, and I look forward to seeing you folks next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.